Okay, we, we move on from uh, that to uh, another very topical uh, uh, lecture, which is the long-term cardiovascular sequelae of uh, COVID-19. So I think this will be of much interest to you. And to speak to us about it, uh, we have Dr. Betty Raman, who is Associate Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Radcliffe Department of Medicine in the University of Oxford. She's an expert in uh, cardiovascular imaging, particularly inherited cardiovascular diseases. But COVID, like with main, most of us, made her move a little bit into a, an area that she had not previously researched in, which was the impact of COVID in cardiovascular disease. And she leads the CMORE trial, which is the, the national trial looking at long COVID and the impacts long COVID has on the cardiovascular system. So I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Raman, and please do take the stage. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Jacob. This is an absolute pleasure to be able to present to uh, such a lovely audience today. Um, so I'm an academic cardiologist um, from the Radcliffe Department of Medicine um, at the University of Oxford. I'm here to talk about the long-term effects of COVID-19. Uh, here are my disclosures. So many of you are probably wondering why on earth do we have to listen to a talk about coronavirus disease again? You know, are we not done with this yet? Is this not the end of the pandemic? So just to put things in perspective, I thought I'd rewind the clock by three years and just take you through some of the um, issues or headlines that made the news in 2019 before the coronavirus outbreaks. So on the 17th of November, which is exactly today, but three years ago, we had Jeremy Corbyn vowing to protect the NHS from US drug firms. Little did he know what happened the next year. Oh, and there was this one. Sorry, um, that was just a mistake. It was meant to be there. And then the following year, you have the government of uh, the United Kingdom taking immense precautions, um, you know, with COVID restrictions and self-isolation and mask. Um, and we all know what happened after this with uh, Boris Johnson. A year later, people are finally taking coronavirus uh, infection seriously. Uh, we have more widespread efforts to vaccinate individuals. Um, and when the government listened, we now feel a bit reassured, severe diseases much rarer we're all unmasked walking around freely um so we're at the end of the pandemic aren't we on the same day there was this headlines in the guardian covid 19 cases again exploding fourth wave in australia but i must admit we're in a much better place than we were uh in 2019 and 2020 uh, but for millions of people across the globe, COVID still remains a major issue. Millions are still suffering from the long sting of coronavirus disease, a condition called long COVID. Long COVID is a patient coined term, which was made popular by social media, Twitter, and refers to a range of multi-system manifestations that one may experience. These include symptoms of chest pain, breathlessness, brain fog, headache, it includes multiple um, systems. And this paper by a patient-led research group nicely captures the range of symptoms one may experience and how this may relapse and remit over time. Long COVID is a, a, the single most important factor over the past couple of years that has resulted in major work absences and it's projected to have major implications economically for uh, societies globally. So it's a significant problem. Now the, preval the prevalence of long COVID, I'm sorry, I'm, there's a slide in between, uh, but essentially that was referring to, that's right, this one. So the prevalence of long COVID has varied based on the studies you refer to. And this really has to do with the cohort characteristics 
and um, of the studies that you see. Because now we know that there are some risk factors that uh, have been shown to increase the risk of long COVID. And if the study, for instance, has enrolled a lot of individuals who have previously hospitalized with more severe disease, you'll find that the prevalence of persistent symptoms is greater in those studies. So what are these risk factors? They include the severity of acute disease, increasing age, being female, um, to echo Professor Merrin's uh, uh, talk on how there has to be more emphasis on research in women, uh, obesity, cardio other cardiovascular risk factors and comorbidities, and the coronavirus variant and the vaccination status of the individual. But fortunately for us in the United Kingdom, there is an organization funded by the government called the Office of National Statistics that has meticulously followed up and monitored the prevalence of post-COVID syndromes and long COVID in the UK. And we have some idea that this would be roughly about 3.3%, the most recent estimates, 2.1 million individuals across the UK are said to be suffering from long COVID. And this is even with the new wave of variants, you know, Omicron and the less severe variants. So what you can see is that it doesn't have to be severe disease, that you can have even mild infections and still have ongoing symptoms. Now, there are a number of mechanisms that have been put forward, theories explaining why people might be having ongoing symptoms. These include perhaps there might be persistent viral reservoirs in the body. They may not be active, they may be inactive, and that might be contributing to a chronic activation, chronic inflammatory process. And in fact, activation, this activation may not necessarily be perfect in clearing the virus, it may be dysregulated. So you have other pathways being activated that contribute to a release of cytokines into the blood and makes you feel like you're still actively infectious. The second one is vascular inflammation, so endothelial dysfunction and a prothrombotic mechanism that might be activated in the context of inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction. And there are a number of uh, studies also showing that in the acute phase, when the immune system is overwhelmed and exhausted, there might be reactivation of other viruses, particularly from the herpes family like Epstein-Barr virus. And perhaps what we're seeing is long COVID may actually be a form of glandular fever, like a post-viral syndrome. Another factor that's been considered is gut dysbiosis. So the microbiota in, in your intestines talk to the immune system and tells it to clear pathogens. And if there's any sort of mismatch in the communication that might propagate ongoing symptoms. And then there's this concept of autoimmunity, which was shown to be important in the acute phase, but there are studies now with a bit more conflicting report as to whether this might be important in the post-acute phase. So why do we as a cardiovascular research group need to know about long COVID? It involves a range of symptoms. So this is a, a really nice study published in The Lancet, um, conducted by Bollering and colleagues in Netherlands, where they studied 70,000 individuals over about 17 months prospectively. They were uninfected, and they found that about 5% of this population developed or uh, caught COVID. And they monitored them with 24 um, questionnaires, 24 assessments over time. And you can see that in the dotted line are controls. So people who were not infected by SARS-CoV-2 and people, um, and the bold line represents those who caught COVID. And in red are women, blue men. And you see that there is a clear increase in certain symptoms, particularly cardiopulmonary symptoms, breathlessness and chest pain after exposure to coronavirus infections on the right. And this is sustained for weeks. So what you're seeing is perhaps this is why we're getting so many referrals as cardiologists um, and uh, you know preventative doctors, GPs for management of cardiovascular risk because these patients have ongoing cardiac symptoms. And it's important for us to understand why that might be. What is currently unclear is to what extent these ongoing symptoms indicate cardiac damage. So what is this overlap between myocardial injury assessed objectively and ongoing symptoms? And even the relative size of the two circles that you have on this slide 
are not clear. So there's more research that's needed in this space. I'm sorry, I'm, I think I'm failing with this remote. <laughs> okay. So, and what is the evidence that there, there is an increased incidence of cardiovascular diagno diagnoses? What's the evidence that coronavirus infections can cause cardiac damage? So this paper on the left by researchers from St. Louis, Missouri in the United States looked at the Veterans Healthcare Database. This is a retrospective study of electronic medical health records. And they looked at approximately 150,000 people who caught COVID and compared them to 5 million control subjects who, who had not caught COVID. And another, there was another group, another control group after a non-COVID infection. And what they showed was that regardless of which group you looked at, whether you looked at those who were recovering from severe infections as indicated in orange and purple, or those who were recovering in the community from COVID, there was an increased risk of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular diagnoses uh, across all patients if they had COVID-19. So this is an important study. It looked at quite a large number of individuals. Now, one might argue that this is just a the result of selection bias from a predominantly male population. So in the UK, we looked at the UK biobank cohorts. So ourselves and investigators from UCL, Professor Stefan Peterson and Zara. And as you know, that the UK biobank population tend to be a much lower risk cohort. And we evaluated a considerably smaller number of individuals. But you can see in the first panel that all the risks that were seen in the Veterans Healthcare Study on the left were again seen in the UK biobank population in individuals who recovered from COVID-19. And by the way, these were predominantly non-hospitalized individuals. So these were patients who recovered in the community from mild infections, very similar to what you're seeing right now with the latest variants. So this is interesting, but of course, a large part of that effect was driven by severe infections. And one of the most common complications in, in those panels of cardiovascular complications is arterial and venous thrombo, thrombotic complications. Um, and a question that many people have is that, isn't that risk just escalated in the acute phase? Is all this effect just in the first four weeks? So this question was answered by a study published recently in Circulation where they looked across the UK in like 48 million individuals and about 200,000 patients um, had COVID and they compared the COVID group to an un uninfected group and they showed that yes, the risk of arterial and venous throm thrombotic complications was highest in the acute phase and it does decline after the first week, but that risk is still sustained up to 49 weeks from the infection. So this risk is prevalent for a prolonged period of time, not just venous thrombotic risk, but also arterial thrombotic risks. So to understand why someone might be at risk of arterial and venous thrombotic complications, investigators in Oxford tried to image the arteries of patients recovering from COVID-19. So this is work led by Professor Harris Antoniadis, who many of you might know as the pioneer of CT-based imaging of vascular inflammation. So he identified this novel CT-based biomarker called fat attenuation index, which looks at the fat surrounding the blood vessels. And using the CT-based characteristics of the fat, he was able to identify vascular inflammation. There's a lot of histological validation behind that method. But in this study, what he did was he identified a separate COVID-19 specific vascular signature of inflammation, just looking at the fat surrounding the blood vessels and using machine learning and RNA sequencing data and biopsy data. And he's identified this novel CT-based biomarker called C19RS. He showed that in a cohort in Oxford, C19RS powerfully predicted in-hospital mortality. And he provided external validation for that from a cohort in Bath and Leicester. They also show that in patients who were treated with dexamethasone, that this particular biomarker was um, had improved with treatment. 
and they showed that in some individuals, this biomarker was abnormal even after weeks after recovering from the acute infection, suggesting that there was evidence of vascular inflammation beyond the acute phase, and that this might be contributing to the increased arterial and venous thrombotic risks seen in patients recovering from coronavirus infections. So do we have any diagnostic tests for post-COVID cardiovascular complications? So there's no substitute for a good history and examination. And this might seem a bit comical, you know, I mean, am I, am I not stating the obvious? But I think if you consider cardiac symptoms in the context of other symptoms and, and really pay attention to the story, you might find that, that there are cases out there who do convincingly tell you that this is an ischemic pattern of injury or this is myocarditis. On the other hand, there are other um, you know, patients that we get referred to where you get a constellation of symptoms and there's no specific feature to suggest the underlying etiology. So there's clearly no substitute for history and examination in patients. Other tests that are being used in clinics are blood biomarkers of cardiac injury, which certainly help us screen for uh, more significant underlying LV dysfunction. ECG, ambulatory ECG monitors, just to even look at heart rate variability, which may be a marker of autonomic dysfunction, non-invasive imaging modalities, such as echocardiography, and in expert centers, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, um, SPECT, and other nuclear medical medicine uh, approaches, and uh, invasive measures in uh, selected cases where the etiology or the diagnosis is unclear. So we know that ECHO has a place in uh, the, the assessment of cardiac dysfunction in the acute setting. There have been a number of studies showing that echocardiography has uh, incremental prognostic value and has an impact on management of patients. Um, there are a number of follow-up studies looking at what happens to people with acute LV dysfunction uh, on echocardiography. Do they improve? And the majority of these studies, which are uh, small in size, tend to show improvement with very, very few people having residual impairment uh, involving the left and the right ventricle. But when you look at larger sort of population studies, cross-sectional studies, we start seeing an effect. So there does appear to be reduced left ventricular function in patients recovering from COVID-19. Now, obviously these cross-sectional studies are um, inherently flawed because we can't measure every possible confounder in individuals and there might be some concealed confounding variable that is biasing to this effect but this may explain why we see a higher risk of cardiovascular diseases in population studies when you look at the veterans healthcare database and the uk biobank so i think i think this is something that is a discussion which is evolving and with more data would probably be more confident in um, ascertaining whether these findings that are being that are published are in fact related to coronavirus infections now cardiac magnetic resonance uh, is a non-invasive imaging tool which has multiple strengths beyond echocardiography in assessing the heart um, it looks at the the texture of the myocardium and by looking at the by assessing patterns of myocardial injury one can infer the etiology of myocardial damage and this early study on the left uh, is by investigators from UCL and Royal Free in London, where they showed that cardiac magnetic resonance in, done in patients with evidence of an elevated troponin in the acute setting had um, quite a, a useful role in discerning the cause for myocardial injury with 26% having evidence of myocarditis um, and 22% evidence of ischemia and infarction and about 6% uh, having mixed pattern. And there's another large multi-center study led by Professor Greenwood, where they're actually seeing a higher burden of ischemic injury. So uh, the jury is still not out yet um, as to which is more common, but it does appear that myocardial injury, um, persistent myocardial injury, injury is prevalent in those with signs of myocardial damage in the acute setting. So what about patients with milder infections? So we've looked at the UK Biobank imaging data. So the UK Biobank, um, is a unique resource because they scanned thousands of individuals before the pandemic. So we had pre-infection cardiac imaging as well as brain imaging. Um, and so 
many of these patients, oh, sorry, many of these individuals were invited back to have a scan, um, and uh, particularly those who had recovered from the infection. And so in a study where we had about 200 individuals who were recovering from COVID-19 and a propensity match control group, we studied longitudinal changes in cardiac and aortic phenotypes. And actually, we did not see a significant difference between the two groups. But this was a preliminary study with smaller numbers um, and uh, they, they actually uh, scan more than 1,000 patients, so we're going to look at the larger data as well. Now, I've led some uh, research in Oxford where we're studying the effects of coronavirus infections uh, on the heart in the context of multi-organ health. Um, and in a local study, we undertook um, serial MRI scans in patients recovering from COVID-19. And in the, in the early post-acute phase, we saw that in a proportion of individuals, about 23% of individuals, there was evidence of cardiac inflammation. But actually on follow-up, we found that much of this actually resolved and improved over time. And the bar chart that you see here is the, the severity of or the prevalence of cardiopulmonary symptoms in individuals. And you can see that at two to three months, um, you know, quite a high proportion of individuals had cardiopulmonary symptoms. And by six months, this reduced, but one in two patients continue to have ongoing symptoms even by six months from infection. Now, just to say that this was a post-hospitalized patient group, so they were individuals with more severe infections. We also tried to see whether any of our diagnostic tests could tell us why people have ongoing symptoms, and we did not see an association between cardiac MRI measures or cardiopulmonary exercise tests and ongoing symptoms. Now, this study came from Professor Colin Berry's uh, group in Glasgow. Um, it's a it's an excellent study. Uh, they evaluated 159 individuals uh, who were discharged from hospital at an early time frame, early post-acute time frames, so about 28 to 60 days from infection. And they found that 13% of patients discharged from hospital had evidence of myocarditis on MRI based on something called the Lake Louise criteria, which incorporates clinical parameters as well. And the interesting thing here is that they showed that the diagnosis of myocarditis associated with an impaired quality of life uh, at 12 months, but also show that uh, it potentially explains why some people may be limited from a physical capacity point of view. Now, are there other um, features that might suggest why someone might have ongoing symptoms or brain fog or cognitive impairment. This is an excellent study led by um, Professor Steve Smith from the University of Oxford, looking again at the UK Biobank, uh, Biobank's imaging repository. And what they showed was, so they studied patients recovering from coronavirus infection as well as controls. And what they found was that COVID-19 was associated with associated with an age-related decline in regions of the brain that were centrally important for processing of olfactory signaling as well as for cognition. So this, this study is quite an important study because it's the first study where you can actually start seeing that structural damage might explain ongoing symptoms in patients. So with this in mind, uh, we embarked on a multi-center uh, study where um, we had we have um, essentially enrolled patients of the FOSCOVID study, which is a national follow-up program across the UK, looking at post-hospitalized patients. And we've undertaken multi-organ MRI scans in approximately 500 patients across the UK. Uh, now, in an early pilot study, as I mentioned before, we found that multiple organs were demonstrating signs of inflammation and that these MRI features of inflammation correlated with blood biomarkers of inflammation. So we thought that perhaps inflammation might be driven by viral reservoirs in certain organs. Now, although I can't disclose um, the, the, the entire uh, study to you just in the interest of time, what we are seeing is a multi-organ axis that might be driving ongoing inflammation in patients. And we're definitely seeing increased risk in patients with COVID-19 relative to controls, even when we adjust for multiple confounders. So this is um, a really interesting work that uh, I am hoping to discuss in the future. 
So another common manifestation that patients with post-COVID syndromes experience is a reduced exercise tolerance and cardiopulmonary exercise tests have shed some important light into the mechanisms of why that might be. There are cardiac and respiratory um, factors, but in the absence of cardiorespiratory causes, skeletal muscle impairment plays a really dominant role. So the study on the right is an invasive CPET study where they exercised 10 individuals with coronavirus infections, had a swan gun, so a right heart um, cath while the patient was exercising, and they monitored both cardiac and respiratory performance quite closely. And what they showed was that patients recovering from mild infections had limited exercise tolerance without any restriction in cardiac or respiratory performance, but had reduced oxygen extraction. Um, and this suggests that there might be something occurring at the skeletal muscle level, perhaps mitochondrial dysfunction, perhaps hyperperfusion, that might be, might be contributing to an impaired oxygen extraction um, and limited exercise tolerance in these patients. So with this, uh, in mind, we uh, embarked on a clinical trial looking specifically at uh, managing patients with fatigue, as, because this is the most common symptom experienced by patients with long COVID. Um, we have the capacity to study skeletal muscle metabolism using MRI. There is a technique called uh, phosphorus magnetic resonance spectroscopy that allows us to study high energy phosphate um, you know, use in, in a skeletal muscle. Um, and uh, we found that in patients without significant cardiac and respiratory abnormalities, there were evidence of impaired oxidative phosphorylation in the skeletal muscle with exercise. So we undertook a phase 2A placebo controlled clinical trial of uh, which uh, sought to test the efficacy of an endogenous metabolic modulator on symptoms of fatigue and skeletal muscle metabolism in patients with long COVID. It's a small study, proof of concept study, just to see whether modifying or modulating metabolism can help symptoms. So what you'll see at the bottom is a Sankey's diagram. You see um, patients enrolled in the study were mostly suffering from severe physical fatigue in red. Um, when you look at the placebo group, after four weeks of treatment, there was um, hardly any shift uh, in symptoms. Yes, there were some that improved, but in general, the majority continued to have ongoing fatigue. In patients who received the endogenous metabolic modulator, there was an improvement in, um, in, in fatigue, significant improvement in uh, both physical and mental fatigue in patients with long COVID. Now, the unfortunate thing with this study was that our primary endpoint, which was phosphocreatine recovery rate constant, a non-invasive biomarker of metabolism was highly variable. And um, this only surfaced as the study went, you know, as we conducted the study. And um, so it, it was not significantly different between um, the Excella and placebo arm. But nevertheless, when we look at uh, post hoc analyses um, and responder analyses, there was a correlation between improvement in symptoms and an improvement in multiple markers of mitochondrial function and vascular biology. So moving on to autonomic dysfunction, uh, this is a common manifestation in patients uh, recovering from COVID-19. The most, um, so dysautonomia can have multiple sub phenotypes and one is POTS or orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which essentially refers to sustained increase in heart rate uh, for at least 10 minutes um, with standing or uh, on a head up tilt test. And on the left is a great example published in uh, Jack case reports of a woman in her 40s who had palpitations and who had a head up tilt test uh, showed a marked increase in heart rate in red uh, that was sustained and this reproduced her symptoms. Interestingly, there are a number of symptoms in patient, so in autonomic uh, dysfunction that overlap with long COVID. And many people who have been diagnosed with autonomic dysfunction think they have long COVID. So there's a huge overlap in symptoms. Um, and therefore, uh, the treatment of autonomic dysfunction is, is quite important as it might help patients with uh, long COVID. And the management uh, involves essentially uh, treating any reversible causes, so dehydration, uh, keeping the hydration up, replenishing salt, wearing compression stockings, so, so initially conservative options, and then perhaps identifying the phenotype of 
dysautonomia that someone's experiencing. So for instance, if you have POTS, perhaps beta blockers and ivabradine, as opposed to hypertensive manifestations where you might um, go for an alpha-1 blocker, midradine, uh, to help patients with their symptoms. So many of the studies that I've referred to here have been discussed in this uh, review, comprehensive review, narrative review published in the European Heart Journal by our group. So feel free to uh, refer to this should you have any questions. A lot of the recommendations on that review are in line with the expert consensus uh, statement put forward by the American College of Cardiology. This is an excellent um, consensus statement which provides guidance to physicians on how to manage patients presenting with cardiopulmonary symptoms, new cardiac diagnoses, and even guidance for return to play uh, for athletes with post-COVID syndromes. Um, and finally, I'd, I'd just like to briefly talk about some efforts uh, being undertaken to address this major global health concern. So there is some evidence, mostly retrospective data, looking at the potential benefits of antivirals. Um, there's definitely a clear uh, improvement in long COVID symptoms in patients who take Paxlovid early on um, once they start getting symptoms of coronavirus infections. We know that there are now a lot more studies showing that vaccines do reduce severity of infection and uh, the risk of prolonged infection. There's evidence to suggest that re rehabilitation might be helpful in post-hospitalized patients with ongoing symptoms. No evidence for perfenidone, which is an antifibrotic uh, treatment. And uh, in that study, they were looking at the effects on lung pathology. And there are a number of other studies that are currently in underway, in particular, Stimulate ICP, which is uh, a nationwide study led by Professor Amitava Banerjee from UCL, and they were evaluating um, multiple therapies, including anticoagulation, rivaroxaban, colchicine, and antihistamines. So to summarize, uh, long COVID remains a global health concern despite the declining numbers of severe coronavirus infections. Multiple mechanisms are at play, with some being targeted in clinical trials. Persistent cardiopulmonary symptoms and cardiovascular diagnoses are frequent, but symptoms may not always associate with objective measures of cardiac injury. We know that pre-existing risk factors and health conditions are important. They're closely linked to disease severity as well as ongoing symptoms. And this underscores the need for more aggressive risk factor management uh, in the primary uh, healthcare setting. Non-invasive imaging plays an important role in the follow-up of patients, particularly in those with suspected cardiac injury in the acute and post-acute setting. Dysautonomia is a frequent and disabling manifestation, so do learn how to manage this. It's not that hard. Um, and research into post-COVID syndromes are likely to provide extended insights into other post-viral manifestations and multi-system diseases that present with multiple symptoms. So I encourage you to support research efforts in this space. I'd like to end by thanking my collaborators, specifically Professor Stefan Neubauer, who's my partner when it comes to the Seymour study, but also all the other investigators mentioned here who uh, provided undying support during the pandemic and the FOSCOVID study investigators. And I'd like to thank uh, Sharp. Hi, I'm curious about the way we do trials and studying something like long COVID, which is so multifactorial as you described, and the way we tend to do trials in cardiovascular disease, randomized to people to one drug, see what happens. We described, you know, all the potential different manifesta manifestations, uh, post-disease, and how they may all be contributing to it. Do you think basically the way we do studies in these patients needs to change? Because for example, anecdotally for my friends, having read these papers who are struggling, I'm like, well, better diet, improve your microbiome, what can you do for your mitochondrial health? What can you do for that? And that might be the only way we can help these patients, but the way we practice medicine isn't really set up for that. So I'm just curious if that's something which is being done, thought about. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Um, the trouble with long COVID is that we are still not completely sure of its etiology. Um, and yes, there are multiple theories, but again, with varying levels of evidence, perhaps the most popular and the one with the greatest evidence is the inflammatory hypothesis. And you're right, I think, particularly for a condition like long COVID, where there may be many 
possible explanations, it is important in identifying the subgroup that someone belongs to um, and encourage precision medicine where we define people based on the etiology and, and the symptom profile. Uh, but I think that will require much larger data sets with extensive phenotyping and probably machine learning models to find the, the right phenotype from a symptom perspective, but also from an etiology perspective. But that's the that's hope with, with more research in the space. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm a GP, so I'm going to ask you some practical questions, please. Um, my first one is, this seems to have stopped working. Have I done something? No, it's still working. Um, just not getting the feedback. Fantastic. Um, so we have something called the CARES in Tayside COVID assessment rehabilitation uh, model. Um, uh, and as, as a GP, we could refer there for OT and physio, but I just wondered, bearing in mind the endothelial dysfunction that we're seeing uh, with COVID, uh, post-COVID, whether we should be thinking of using some kind of a toolkit and helping that endothelial dysfunction with perhaps a statin. Uh, part B of that question is, um, interestingly, the thrombotic tendency, you uh, alluded to the fact that can last for up to 49 weeks. Should we be considering the use of some kind of anti-thrombotic? Um, I'll maybe let you answer that and then I've got another couple of comments, please. Yes, sure. So as far as statins is concerned, I mean, I think that would require quite a large study to see an effect. Um, and I suspect that the government is probably not interested in supporting such a study unless it's a pharma company with a new drug. I, I really can't see it happen. But that's why I think as GPs, you just go back to the basics, which is risk factor management. So don't use COVID for the, to manage someone's risk factors. You know, think of the overall risk. Of course, coronavirus infections, we think might escalate that risk. So if you can be aggressive with you know, cholesterol as well as all the other risk factors. I think, um, I think you, you, that's all you can do as, as a GP. Now, as far as the second question was, um, sorry, I've got a uh, memory of a goldfish. Oh, antiplatelets. Yeah, so that is currently being studied as part of the Stimulate ICP study, which um, is well underway with recruitment. And we should find out in a, in a year's time whether or not uh, that is, you know, beneficial for patients. So, so that's a really important question. Yeah, that looked interesting with the rubber oxabel and the culture scene, which some of us olds use quite a lot of. Um, I, and I guess you've also therefore mentioned the next bit, which is how we translate research into practice. Um, for a while there, interesting with the dexamethasone, we were allowed to use uh, budesonide inhalers in general practice for COVID associated lung conditions. Now we can only, we can't do that in Scotland, but in England you can because you can enroll them into a trial. So second question, Again, some of us are old enough to remember 1986 and Chernobyl, and then 20 years later we all saw autoimmune thyroid issues. So I'm quite interested, I know that you're an academic cardiologist, um, and a paediatrician might answer this better, but with the uh, multi-inflammatory system in children, with the scarring and the myocarditis and funny rhythms, and I do wonder when, whether we might see a lot of that in 20 years. Uh, and I'm just going to ask you my other one. Quite interested in the mitochondria. I'm going to say mum always gets the blame because I've read that uh, the genetics of the mitochondria dictate how we respond to COVID and what our inflammatory response is, whether that's the cytokines, the interleukin-6, whatever. Um, so that could be interesting for genomics and possibly with a view to who we vaccinate in future and also um, whom we treat. Yeah, no, that's that's an interesting point. I think that just definitely requires more research at this stage. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd be happy to collaborate and expand that because we have quite a large database of individuals, you know, who are um, suffering from long COVID. Uh, 